Okay, let's turn to 1 Samuel chapter 20. Well, we're moving right through here. 1 Samuel chapter 20, what a great book this has been. Uh, it looks like there's uh, 28, 29, 31 chapters. So um, if you'll remember with me last week, um, Saul again tried to pin David to the wall with a spear. He's become uh, uh, angry and murderous in his heart. Uh, fear has set in. Jealousy has set in. And he does not want David to be the heir to the throne. And, and listen, God has already rejected Saul. And you need to see in this that Saul is a type of Satan. He's right now the king of the nation, but he's been rejected. He's right now ruling, but he's living on his own means, and he's, and he's doing what he wants to do and not what God wants to do. And David has already been anointed as king. And so he's the future king. And listen to me. If you're going to choose a king in your life, choose the one that God has chosen. And God has chosen King Jesus to rule over our lives. And so here in this sense, David is a type of Christ, and Saul is a type of the devil. And I want you to see, because we're getting ready to transition a little bit. And when David is being led by the Spirit, when David is following God, he's a type of Christ. When he's trusting in God, he's a type of Christ. But there's going to be some times here now as we look at him, we have to remember he's a physical person. He's a physical king. And he's going to live in a physical way. And he's going to begin to doubt and he's not trusting God. And he's not a type of Christ in that sense. But listen, you and I are the same way. We become children of God who are supposed to be led by the Spirit of God. And we're supposed to be living by faith in the Messiah of God, the provision of God. And when we are, we are a great type of, of Christ. We're ambassadors for Christ. We become the light of people's world as we're living by faith and telling them what God wants us to tell them. And we're living out loud for them. We're the same type because we're the example of Christ to them as ambassadors. So it's not some really weird thing to say that a person who's living in a Christ-like way becomes an example of Christ to other people. That's how our witness works in this world. But we can also be a bad witness. We can also be distracting to other people who want to learn how to follow Christ. And so we need to learn how to follow Christ by being led by the Spirit of God. So David here has a spear thrown at him again. And Saul has tried to kill him. And he, if you remember, in 1918, it says, So David fled and escaped, and he went to Samuel at Ramah and told him all that Saul had done to him. And so here, God made a way of escape. And, and, and David has escaped, and he got back to where? Where did he escape to? He escaped back to the place, to the person who anointed him. His way of escape was running back to the word of God that came from the prophet of God, Samuel. And you listen to me. When the enemy is attacking you and you're looking for a way of escape, when you're looking for a place to flee, you always submit to God before you flee. You always want to get back to the word of God. Get back to the truth of God. Get back to the way of God. You don't want to flee and find yourself in the wilderness with no help. You don't want to run away from God. You want to run to God. Listen to me. David ran to the right place. And then Saul sends these messengers three times. And what happens when they get there, they begin to prophesy. The Spirit of God comes upon them, and they join in the worship service. And they cannot even take him. And then the same thing happens when King Saul comes down there, the rejected king. He comes down there, and we find him in the last one. Four attempts, five attempts in the last two chapters to kill David. 
To, and that's exactly what Saul wants to do to David, is the same thing the devil wants to do to Jesus. He wants to kill the message. He wants to kill the message. He wants to kill the, the ambassador. He wants to kill the person of Jesus in the world today. Why do we take it out of the schools? So we can kill it from being trained into children's lives. Why do we take it out of the homes? So we can kill it. Why do we take God out of society? So we can kill the message of Christ. And when we allow that and we don't speak out, we're allowing the devil to kill the witness of Christ around us. So here's the sad part. David defeated Goliath, certain death in the valley. We've talked about that many times. He's the only one that's uniting the nation. The nation's coming together. They're all looking at David and they're celebrating that David is defeating the enemy. But every time he wins a victory, Saul gets more afraid that his kingdom is going to be taken right now. He gets more jealous because he sees David is becoming more popular and he wants to kill him more and more and more. Here's the sad fact. He is going to try to kill David, and David's getting ready to go on the run for a while. And the only person that's even helping Saul maintain his kingdom is David. Listen, it's the same way with us. The only person that's helping us live our lives and has given us salvation, he poured out his blood for us at Calvary, is Jesus Christ. We get in trouble. What do we do? We run from him, and we go to the world for help. We flee and escape to the wrong place. The only one that can help us is the one who gave his life for us. There's no other way and no other place to escape to, to flee to. Everything else is us relying upon our own skill, our own power, our own knowledge. It's relying upon our own strength, and it's going away from the throne room of God. First, you always run to God. If God tells you to go somewhere else, then go somewhere else. But if God doesn't tell you to go anywhere else, then you wait upon God. He is our ever-present help in time of need. He is the one who loves us with a never-ending love. He is the one who came down from his throne room and died on a cross and poured out his blood to make us right with him. And he is the one who loves us. Others may love our money. Others may want something else from us, but if they're not giving us the counsel of the word of God, then they are really involved in the deception to destroy the ways of God. And it's the ways of God we must live in and walk in and believe in and trust in. So here's David. He escapes. And he is safe in Naioth of Ramah with Samuel. Think about this. Everybody that tries to get him has to begin joining in the worship. Doesn't that mean that he's safe? Wouldn't you feel safe in a position like that? Everybody, here, four examples. Messengers come. Instead of being able to arrest David or kill him or take him back to Saul, they have to worship. Messengers come again, same thing. Messengers come again, same thing. Finally, the, 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 one, the king who sent the messengers come down. And the same thing happens to him. Not only that, but the Bible tells us that he had to be stripped of his clothes. And I believe it was just his royal robes. It was a sign that he had lost his kingship. I don't believe he was really naked naked. And the word can be used in a couple different ways. Can be completely naked or just naked of his outer garments. I believe that, that his son Jonathan laid down his royal robes and began to choose the king that God had chose. And I believe that Saul is fighting against God. Think about that. He's fighting against God. He thinks in his own power that he can defeat the way of God, the word of God, and the will of God. And see, that's really what the devil is doing, right, in the world today. That's why he's trying to kill Jesus. He thinks in his own power that he can defeat the word of God, the way of God, and the will of God. And he can get us to follow him instead of following God. And that's why you have to stay focused on what the word says and where the spirit is leading you. Or you end up following and fleeing someplace 
that will cause you more problems. You understand what I'm saying to you? It's the Word of God. It's the throne room of God. It's the answer that comes from God that is our provision for life. And as long as the Spirit was moving there, I believe David should have stayed there. That's my opinion. Lots of things have been taught about this text. I believe he was safe there. Even, even Saul had to take off his royal garment because the Spirit of God was there. And I believe he was safe there. But what we find is that um, David flees. Let's look at it together. It's chapter 20. Then David fled from Naoth of Ramah and went and said to Jonathan. Remember, Jonathan means Jehovah given. I believe it's a type of God's grace. Because John in the New Testament means the Lord is gracious. And Jehovah has given us that grace. So it's Jehovah given. And he says to Jonathan, who's his good friend, what have I done? What is my iniquity and what is my sin before your father that he seeks my life? Now listen, because up to this point, I believe that David has been fully trusting in God. But now I believe he just kind of, in a tinge, begins to waver. I don't know that fear has completely come in because I think that fear is the opposite of trust or belief or faith in God. And, and because fear of man produces a stumbling block, but the fear of God produces righteousness. And when we know that we're in God's hands and that we're okay in the place we're at, then we don't have to fear. We can actually trust God that everything that's going on is good for us, even if it's bad, even if it hurts, even if somebody's trying to take our lives. We want to be wise, but we know that we're indestructible until God is finished with us. And so we can trust him because he's the one that's called us. He's the one that died for us. He's the one that saved us. He's the one that promised us he'll get us across the finish line. And he's going to take us to heaven to live with him forever. So listen to me. I, I, I'm not sure, but I think David probably should have stayed close to the word of God. He should have stayed with Samuel, the prophet of God. He should have stayed in the place where the spirit of God was being poured out. And his life was safe. But he's going to enter into a time where he is running in his own strength. He's still, he's still the anointed of God, the future king of Israel. He's still uh, 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 protected by God. But God is training him, teaching him. He's, putting, he's testing him. And he's wanting him to come back to a full trust in him. And that's what he does with you and me. Just because bad things happen doesn't mean that God doesn't love us with a never-ending love. He's Amen. testing us. He's trying us. He's proving us. He's burning out the dross in our life, and he's making us look more like his son Jesus, who trusted him perfectly for life and godliness. Listen to me. David flees, and now he's questioning. What have I done? What is my iniquity? What is my sin before your father that he seeks to kill me? Listen, the devil wants to kill you because of who you represent. The devil wanted to kill David because he represented God and he was walking wisely and he was the anointed future king. He, it didn't matter what David's sin was, which I'm sure he had sin because every man ever born did. The devil wants to kill you and me because we represent Jesus as ambassadors for Christ, okay? So no matter what goes on, the place for us to flee is to truth. The way to go is back to truth. We want to run back to Jesus, back to the Word of God. Never run away from God and think that God is against you. No matter what happens, He's testing us to see if we will trust Him. He's testing us to see if we'll run to the world, we'll run to our own means, or if we'll run back to him and draw closer to him. And we always want to draw back to him. Listen, true faith is always turning back to God because you trust him. Even when it hurts, 
You trust Him even when the doctor says this is bad. You trust Him even when there's nothing there and you can't see how you're going to get through it. You still trust God because He's a trustworthy God. He's never lied. He takes great care of His children. He loves you. You always have to turn back to Him. Now listen. While you're in the throne room, while you're with God, while you're trusting God, there's nothing wrong with getting a heavenly perspective. There's nothing wrong with getting a, a, a perspective and saying, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Look what just happened. Now, wait a minute. Is there, is it, is there sin in my life? Is there something I have done? What have I did to deserve this? Listen, there's nothing wrong with, with doing an inspection of how you're living. There's nothing wrong with keeping a short sin list and always confessing your sin. There's nothing wrong with saying, search me and know me, God. Uh, try me and know my anxious thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me, yet lead me in the way everlasting. That's where we want to stay. There's nothing wrong with getting that perspective and finding out what is going on, but we never want to doubt. That's the opposite of faith. You don't need to doubt that God loves you. He proved his love when he poured out his blood. He proved his love when he died for us. He proves his love and it never changes. Listen to me. If you believe in Jesus, that, that, that he is the Messiah, that he died and that he rose again, and that his father sent him as the provision for your sin nature, then he loves you. Then, then, then you become born again. And that never changes if you'll keep running back to him and not run away from him. You'll understand the peace that surpasses all understanding. So there's nothing wrong with getting a perspective of what's going on. But don't forget that God allows the enemy to attack. He allows it. He allows it. So that you will see your heart and you will say, Lord, look what's in my heart. How do we get that out? Burn it out. Forgive me. And he continues to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Do not be afraid when the enemy pursues. <laughs> Take the way of escape that God gives you. And trust him because he's still on the throne. Even when it hurts, he's still moving you toward heaven. He's still moving you toward Christ likeness. He's still moving you toward his kingdom forever. You're his child and he loves you. But there is training and there's chastisement. And there is the burning out of things that need to be purified for our life from our lives. And so that's what he's doing. He's equipping David to be the king. He's brought him into the throne room. He showed him that it's not always fun in the throne room. He showed him that there's things that can happen there. And even when you're living for God, there's people that hate you. There's people that will try to kill you. There's people that will talk bad about you. There's people that will lie about you. There's all kinds of things that's going to happen. But God still loves you and you can trust him Fully. So you might say, well, why, why would you say that David is not trusting God? Well, we're going to see that here in a minute, David and Jonathan is going to conspire a plan that is deceptive. And then Jonathan is going to dishonor his father by lying to him. And then in the next chapter, David lies to a priest. So we see that David begins to rely on his own plans instead of trusting the God's plans. Instead of trusting God's ways, instead of saying, Lord, what should I do? He's beginning to take over in his own strength and try to, try to get away from the enemy who's pursuing him. Listen to me. It's not going to go well. Because you have no way of defeating the devil other than surrendering to the truth of God. You have to submit to God in order to resist the devil. When you run and you flee on your own and it's not God's way, it can get really bad. And things can get really ugly. Yet God is still there. He still loves you. He still loves you with a never-ending love. He still will bring you through it. But you, he's going to teach you 
that you cannot do it your way. You cannot do it the world's way. You cannot defeat the devil in, in the devil's way. You have to do it in God's way, in God's timing, according to God's word and God's plan for your life. And that is to surrender to the way, the truth, and the life. You can't make up stuff and begin to, to, to make your own plans and do your own thing. So the training becomes um, what this is all about as he runs for some 10 years I think more from Saul, but he never, never lays his hands on God's anointed. A great lesson is to be learned for us from that. That when God sets somebody up, we we need to keep our hands off of God's anointed because that is God's uh, uh, um, person and God will deal with them. Even though God had rejected Saul, God could have killed him at any second, right? And put David on the throne. But he was preparing David for the throne. God might be calling you someplace, but he's going to train you first. And he's going to, you know what he's doing? He's taking David out of David. Does that make sense? Listen, you know what God's doing with you? He's taking you out of you. He wants Christ in you. Christ alone. Just as he brought the children out of Egypt, and then he had to take Egypt out of the children. And the first generation, all of them, 40 years, had to die in order to get all of that bad teaching and that bad life and all of that worldliness and that Egyptianness out of the generation. He had to wait to the next generation. And that's what he wants to do with you and I. He gave us salvation. He delivered us from self. He delivered us from sin. And, and, and he's brought us into a place now he wants to deliver us from our own flesh. Deliver us from our own means, our own desires, our own ways. Because you and I will run from God instead of run to him. And we'll think we're going in the right direction. And the devil will deceive us. But the right direction is to stay in the word, prayer, and fellowship. And if you believe nothing else about it, believe that God loves you. And you always have the cross to be your reminder of the evidence. See, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You're always remembering the evidence of faith. So you look back and say, why is my faith real? Because there's evidence. There's substance there. There's evidence. Faith cannot be standing alone. You're having faith in something. You're having faith in the blood of Jesus. You're trusting in that faithfulness of Jesus. You're trusting by faith in some evidence that is there. And the evidence that Jesus is the Messiah is the resurrection. Because God accepted the sacrifice. So there's something substantial to have faith in. And in this case, the most substantial, you can trust Him. Even when it's bad, you trust Him. Even when it's good. See, it's really easy for you guys and me and, and uh, Christians in Texas to trust God when everything's going fine. Oh, just have faith in the Lord, brother. It's really easy. But when the bottom falls out, where do you turn? See, I believe that it's in the easy times that we should be drawing near to God. We should be learning what he's doing. We should be understanding these simple truths that we're seeing right now. Because when you hit the wrong nail with the hammer, that's not the time to decide what you're going to do. Your heart should already be ready when the bad things happen. Your heart should already be trained to run back to Jesus. I always tell the story of this street fight that happened. And this guy swung a baseball bat at a buddy of mine. And instead of pulling him away from the baseball bat, he was pushed into the baseball bat. Because the impact is less the closer you are to the baseball bat. Home run hitters hit home runs when they can extend. And the person who pulled him away had the, had the forethought to, pull, to push him instead of pulling are you here with me? Because if he would have pulled him away, he'd have killed him with that baseball bat. And the closer you are to God, when bad things happen, the less the impact. 
the less that it hurts you, the less harm. If you're way on the other side of the planet when something, the bottom falls out, and you have to come running back to God. You know how hard it is to get back to his throne room, to get back to his lap, to get back into that peace and know that he loves you. You're going to always think, oh, this is because I've been running from God. Oh, this is because I'm a prodigal. Oh, this is because I didn't read my Bible this week. Listen, no, God's love doesn't change no matter where you're at if you're truly his child. My children can come home at any time to my house and they're welcome there. God's always looking for prodigals to come back. But listen, if you're way out there and the bottom falls out, the impact is much worse. Amen. But when you're sitting in his lap, when you're doing what you're supposed to do and the bottom falls out, you can fall on your face and say, Lord, I've received the good from you. Now how do I react in the bad? I need wisdom here. I need counsel here. And then he gives you that peace. That you're in his hands. And that's what the children of God are missing today. And we run to the world. We run to where everybody else is running for our help. Instead of to a loving father who's already given his most prized possession. How will he not give us everything else we need for life and godliness? Listen to me. David is giving us a great example of being Christ-like and living in the Spirit and following and trusting God, now he's going to give us a great example of what we should not do. And that is rely upon our own resources, our own means. But it's easy to do. All of us do it. You know, in fact, all of us are more like Saul than we are David. All of us are more jealous and hateful and angry and we want to be king on the throne than we want to let somebody else be king. All of us want to get rid of the other people that are the center of attention. And you might not want to say, hey man, brother, preach it. But listen to me. In the flesh, that's what the devil wants all of us to do because our sin nature always wants to be selfish, always wants it to be about us, always wants to be an enemy with God. That's our sin nature. So we're more like the rejected king than we are the, the, the chosen coming king. But when we come to God and his family, he puts his spirit in us who is endeavoring to make us like the chosen future king. So we have to die to self and understand our position of being crucified with Christ and us no longer living, but the life that we now live in that flesh that wars against the spirit in the flesh. We live by faith. There it is again, the evidence. We live by faith in the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. So we're more like Saul, but God died. And when we believe that, he wants to make us more like David when he's a type of Christ. And so we're going to do what David did. We're going to start to fight with the flesh. And that's what David's doing. God's not taking this away quick enough. God's not putting me on the throne quick enough. And I'm not taking that guy out because he's God's anointed and God's in control. But maybe if I do this, maybe if I go here, maybe if I do that, maybe if I start asking these questions, what have I done? What's my iniquity? What is my sin before your father that he seeks my life? He would ask Jonathan. Listen to me. Those are good questions. If you think there's sin in your life, if you think you've done something wrong, the Holy Spirit will convict you. Listen, do you have any friends in your life right now? Listen to me. Do you have any friends in your life right now that you would ask those questions? When good things happen, when bad things happen, and you go, hey, hey, I'm just trying to get some counsel here, and this just happened, and have you noticed anything in my character? Am I doing anything that, that might be sinful? Am I living in a way that, 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 you know, why in the world would this be happening? And then they encourage you and they counsel you that the, that, that the sun rises and sets on the just and the unjust, that it rains on the just and the unjust. And then, and then they might be able to counsel you about something you're doing. You understand what I'm saying? Or they might just tell you, hey, you know what? The devil's going to kill you because you're living right. The devil is going to try to kill you and seek your life because you represent Jesus. Because you represent as an ambassador. But you have to get that perspective. And you should have a checkoff list. 
not for works, but because we know if we're out of fellowship with the Father in heaven, then we're going to reap what we sow. And sometimes we can be causing and fleeing God and running from the place of safety in the secret place instead of running to God. We can be causing the problem by going to the wrong place. See, he's leaving. David fled the place that God gave him to escape to. And we need to be careful not to do that. So here's what Jonathan answers. Here's what Jehovah given says. Verse 2. By no means you shall not die. Indeed, my father will do nothing either great or small without first telling me. And why should my father hide this thing from me? It is not so. Now listen, there's a couple things here. Because the devil's a tactician and he knows how to destroy Here's the main thing. Is remember, Saul took an oath again with Jonathan and told him that David, he wasn't going to kill David. And that's how David was back in the throne room again. Well, Saul realizes, and David's getting ready to give him that wisdom, Saul realizes that Jonathan loves David so much that he's already given him his royal robes. He's already, he's already given up to the fact that he's going to choose the king that God has chosen. So when Saul breaks this oath and tries to kill him four different times, five if you count throwing the spear, Jonathan doesn't know about it. Jonathan has no idea. That's why he's saying, no, 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 my dad made an oath, and he's not going to do anything, and he's not going to make any plans without first telling me. Listen, the devil's not your friend. Saul's the type of the devil. And you might think that you're going to know what the devil's getting ready to do. You might think that you know what's happening, but you don't. Because we can't see into the spiritual realm. All we can do is keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. Keep our eyes fixed on the way, the truth, and the life. Keep our life fixed upon his ways, his word. Keep our lives fixed upon doing what's right and keep our lives fixed upon the fact that he loves us with a never-ending love no matter what's going on in your life. If it's cancer, if, it, if, if it's sickness, if it's you just won the lottery, you shouldn't be playing it. But if you just did something good, if no matter good, bad, or indifferent, because of what Jesus did and finished on the cross for us and we believe in it, God's love does not change for us. Does his justice, does his, does his punishment, does his chastisement, do those things change? Yes, but they're always for our good. They're always to draw us back. They're always to bring us to our senses. They're always to educate us and make us understand that he wants good for us and we should be led by the Spirit, not by our emotions, not by what's happening in our life. Don't be led by the next pain. Don't be led by the next sickness. Don't be led by the next gadget that's for sale. Be led by the Spirit of God. And then you're always going to be in the right place with God to make the right decision. And He gives you wisdom for the moment. And the good news is, is when a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. The good news is, is when you commit your works unto the Lord, he establishes your thoughts for you. So you need to first commit completely to his love, commit completely to his way, commit to his counsel, his word, and don't flee the place he gives you to escape like David has done here. But Jonathan doesn't know that his dad has snuck off Chucked a spear. I don't know where Jonathan was at. Then he sent messengers to try to kill David. Then he went down himself to try to kill David. So David's going to tell him this story, reading between the lines. David's going to tell him, dude, dude, your dad just tried to kill me five times. And you're acting like he's going to tell you everything. No, he's deceiving you too. Then David took an oath again. And said, your father certainly knows that I have found favor in your eyes. And he has said, do not let Jonathan know this. Not his, don't let Jonathan know the plans. He's keeping it from Jonathan, lest he be grieved. But truly, as the Lord lives, as your soul lives, there is but one step between me and death. 
So he's told him, he probably said, listen, he's trying to kill me. He's down there now prophesying. He's naked right before God worshiping. And I'm running back here because I know where he's at right now. He says, listen to me. He's hiding it from your eyes. And that's what the devil does. He puts a veil over our eyes and he hides what he's trying to do to us. He's trying to kill us. He's trying to deceive us from following God and staying in the place of escape and spending time in worship and he's hiding and he gets us to flee away from God and that's his best weapon. It's his best weapon to make us think that it's God's fault. And we look at things and say, well, this is God doing this to me. No, God might allow it. You might cause it. The devil's doing it, but God is training us through it and you have to go through it. There's a principle in the Bible that you have to go through it in everything. If you try to, to run from it, to get away from it, if you try to use your own strength to get away from it, then you're always going to end up right back at it. And you have to go through it and learn the lesson. You have to come to know the ways of God, the word of God, and the person of God through the Son of God. And there's... There's... Um, in the New Testament, I think there's three words for know when we want to know the knowledge of God. And there's one that it's in, it, it, there's a know that means intuitively. You just know, I just go because I know this, right? And you know something already. But then there's a know and it's like where you read it and, you, and, you, and you're learning it and you know it because I've already seen that and I know. But the one we want to have is gnosko which is to know by experience. You know, I can tell you all day long God is good, but when you experience it, it's through a love relationship. And that's why you have to practice your faith. That's why you have to practice righteousness. That's why you have to take what you're being equipped with and stand fast in the Lord. And you become gnoskos and you experience it. And you say, yes, God is good. Yes, he loves me. Yes, I want to worship him. Yes, I'm not going to flee him. And when I do, I want him to turn me back. It has to be you. You might know that Jesus is Lord. You might have read in the Bible that Jesus is Lord. But until you're living it and experiencing it, he's never going to be Lord in your life. You're going to let something else be Lord. And you're going to run to the world for help. You're going to run for people for help. And you're going to continue in fear. You're going to continue being dependent upon your own strength. You're going to continue being dependent upon everything except for the Spirit of God who takes the word of God and changes the heart of the children of God. And that's what's going on in our lives. So David has to go through these things. And, you know, here's the thing. As you see it, and we'll see it as we get into uh, more of David's life, he learned some of the lessons and some of them he didn't. And we'll find out that he was a terrible father. We'll find out that he doesn't do a really good job of being king because he's not learning the lessons, but God still brings him into his place of anointing. God still allows him to be a father. God still allows him to be a husband. God still allows him to be a warrior. God still allows him and brings him into the place because his promises are true. But, but do we want to get there in what God has called us to do and do it lousy? Do we want to get there to the rewards in the Bema Seat Judgment and get them all burned up because we did nothing for God? No, we want to have God's best. So we want to learn now while he's training us, even when it hurts, so that we can be better servants of God, so that we can be better ambassadors for God, and so we can be better kings and priests for God in his kingdom. So the devil is trying to deceive He's always lying. He's always deceiving. Remember, Saul's the type of the devil. He made an oath. Oh, I'll let David live. And then as soon as Jonathan went over here to do something else, bam, he tries to kill him five times. And he says, but there's only one step between me and death. Now, that, there's a few ways to look at that. One is, he's like, I'm only a step ahead of him. He's coming back here in a minute, Jonathan. And if he catches me, he's going to kill me. There's another way to look at it. 
you know, you and I are indestructible till God's finished, but it could be one step from now. It's, we don't know when it is. We don't know when we'll take our last breath, but God does. And then I always like this. There's only one step to life. It's not a 12-step program. That's not what changes your heart. It's one step to Jesus. And if you've been a, a, a prodigal, there's only one step back. You're only one step away from life. You can live in death all your life and be on your deathbed, and it's only one step to come to Jesus. He's an ever-present help in time of need. He's never far away. He's always everywhere. And all you have to do is say, forgive me. All you have to do is say, Lord, forgive me. That's it. One step. But you're always one step the other way, too. You can walk away with one step. In your heart, it's one step, always. Life and death is one step to Jesus. But here in the physical, David knows he's in trouble. And so that's why a lot of people will say, well, this is what he had to do. Rationally, he had to run. He's got to do something. The king's going to kill him. Well, I think when he fled the kingdom, when he fled the throne room, when he fled the place where Saul was at, he went to the safest place, and that's where the prophet of God was at, Samuel. He was there where the word of God was being delivered from. And I don't think that King Saul would kill him in the presence of Samuel. That's just my opinion. We'll never know because David turns to his own devices and his own means. So in verse 4, so Jonathan said to David, whatever you yourself desire, I will do it for you. Whatever you yourself, excuse me, you yourself desire, I will do it for you. Do you see, Jonathan, this, this uh, uh, Jehovah given? It's, it's like whatever. I'm going to fully surrender. I'm your friend. So I think he told him the whole story. Five times he tried to kill me. Now your dad's not telling you, Jonathan. You think he is. And he says, whatever you want, I'll do it for you. So what you, basically saying, well, what's your plan, David? What do you want to do, David? I love you as my own soul. We've already got a covenant and an oath together. We're already the best friends. I've already given you my royal robes, and I know that God has called you to be king, David. And David said to Jonathan, Indeed, tomorrow is the new moon, and I should not fail to set with the king to eat, but let me go that I may hide in the field until the third day at evening. Now listen, every month they would celebrate a type of first fruits. They would celebrate with burnt offerings and a feast, and they, and they would give it all to God. So this is supposed to be a holy festival, a new moon set to perspective. And how's it starting with David's going to make up a plan of deception. Jonathan's going to lie to his dad. His dad's going to try to kill people while they're all worshiping God. This is pure religion. No hearts are following God here at this moment in the way that they're living, even though they think they are. Because really, this, this new moon festival, which, and you can read about it back in uh, Numbers, and I think 1010, 10, this new moon festival was supposed to be to celebrate that we're giving the whole month to you, God. Every month they would blow, what, the silver trumpet. Remember he gave them these silver trumpets? Uh, two of them. One of them blows, all the elders come forward to Moses. Two of them blow, then everybody get your stuff packed up, we're on our way, right? But when the, at the first of the month, every month they would blow one, and, and there were silver trumpets, which is the, the, the uh, silver always represents redemption. And, and they were silver trumpets to worship with, and they would have a meal, and it was always to give God the first fruits to say, we remember, God, your faithfulness. We remember, God, that you're taking care of us. And yet, in this religion, David's plotting to get away. Jonathan's lying with him, and Saul's trying to kill. And they're all sitting there celebrating, and yet their hearts are so far away from God. I believe David is not trusting. He's being fearful. He thinks he's going to die. He was safest over here with the spirit being poured out in Ramah over in Naioth where Samuel was at. And so this new moon, they're getting ready to celebrate. And they would all sit down at a meal together. Let's do it. Verse six. If your father misses me at all, he keeps missing you every time he throws the spear at you. Oh, no, never mind. Because um, God's protecting you. Get a clue, David. 
Then say, David earnestly asked permission of me. See, he's telling him to do this deception. Uh, he already said he's going to hide in the field, but watch what he says. David earnestly asked permission of me that he might run over to Bethlehem, which means house of bread, his city, it's where he's from, for there is a yearly sacrifice there for all the family. Now listen, uh, it, this he's talking about a yearly one. I don't know if it's a, 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 a different month that we should know, and people know that study this a little deeper than me. If he says thus, verse 7, it is well, your servant will be safe. So they're putting a fleece out here. But if he is very angry, be sure that evil is determined by him. So at the same time that they're planning this deception, they're putting a fleece out before God. And I, you should never decide the will of God by a fleece. If seven red cars go by in the next hour, I'm going to switch jobs. That's a fleece. You know, a fleece was most popular by Gideon, you know, where he had to do on the fleece and not on the ground. He had to do on the ground, but not on the fleece. Listen, God honors some things like that sometimes, but we want to just be in the way by the word of God, by the spirit of God, by the will of God. God's already protecting David. And so he kind of fleeces him. If, if you tell him that I went to Bethlehem and he says, oh, OK, that's pretty cool. We'll see him next month. Then he's not really going to kill me because his heart comes out, see? But if he says, this is not good, and then, we're uh oh bad is meant for me. So I'll get out of here. So then he says in verse 8, Therefore you shall deal kindly with your servant, for you have brought your servant into a covenant of the Lord with you. That's pretty big. See how they're still looking at this covenant of the Lord. Nevertheless, if there is iniquity in me, kill me yourself. For why should you bring me to your father? So he's saying, we have this covenant, Jonathan, where you already know that God has anointed me as king. And you've already decided that you're going to let me have it because you gave me your royal robes. You gave me your power and your strength. You gave me your sword and you trust me. And we're best friends here. You remember that from John 15, 13, well, 13, 15, 16, I think. Jesus says to the disciples, I no longer call you servants, but I call you friend because I've told you everything that the Father has shown me. And that's what God wants to show us is everything. He's given us all truth. He's revealing it. And we need friends like this in the body of Christ. And we need friends like this in Christ himself. We need to be so close to him that we're being led by his spirit in all the decisions we make. And he says, we have this covenant. You and I are in a marriage covenant with God. When you believe in that Jesus is Lord and God raised him from the dead, you come into a covenant, a marriage covenant. And David and Jonathan are in such a covenant here together. And David says clearly, Jonathan, you just kill me. You kill me. I don't know about you, but I've been there with the Lord. Just take me home, Lord. This is crazy. Where you go through stuff and you blow it, or you go through stuff and the pain hurts, and you just say, Lord, just take me home. It'd be better to take me home now so that my heart doesn't get worse. Or the pain doesn't get worse. And all David is saying is, you kill me. You're my friend. If you kill me, you'll have mercy on me. But don't let the enemy kill me. Isn't that what we want? Verse 10. This is their plan. We're seeing their plan coming out. It involves deception. It involves lies. That's why I tell you they're not trusting in God. They've become fearful. They want to do it themselves in their own strength. Let's defeat my dad together. Then David said to Jonathan, Who will tell me or what if your father answers you roughly? So they got to have another plan now. Listen, I'm going to be hiding in the secret place. And, and, and if he answers such and such, how am I ever going to know? Who's going to tell me? And Jonathan said to David, so now Jonathan comes up with his part of the plan. I got a plan. Now here's how I'll tell you. Come, let us go out into the field. So both of them went out into the field. Then Jonathan said to David, the Lord God of Israel is witness. When I have sounded out my father, that's what they're doing with the fleece. They're going to sound him out. When he says, where's David at? 
and he tells him, when I've sounded out my father sometime tomorrow or the third day, so there's three days of a feast in the beginning of a month. Notice it's the third day. I like that because Jesus was three days in the belly of the earth. And indeed, there is good toward David, and I do not send to you and tell you, may the Lord do so much more to Jonathan, but if it pleases my father to do you evil, then I will report it to you and send you away that you may go in safety. And the Lord be with you as he has been with my father. Now, I don't even like that statement. Anybody like that statement? That's kind of an interesting statement. When I was reading it, I'm thinking, hey, 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 whoa, whoa, Jonathan. Oh, ho, ho, ho. The, the, the Lord rejected your father. I don't want him to be that way with me. <laughs> so, uh, but you know what? When you're playing with lies and deception, you're playing with that type of rejection. When you're not just surrendering to the truth of God and walking in the wisdom of God and living by the word of God and being the doer of God and not a, a hearer only, you're playing with that type of deception. And you shall not only show me the kindness of the Lord while I still live, that I may not die, but you shall not cut off your kindness from my house forever. No, not when the Lord has cut off every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth. Do you notice that? That is a prophecy. That is, that's not just talking about David because, see, the Messiah comes from David's loins. And one day when all the sons of disobedience have been dealt with and judgment is had, all the enemies will be cut off of David. All the enemies of God will be cut off from the face of the earth. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, let the Lord require it at the hand of, David, of David's enemies. So here's what he's saying. is like, listen, David, me and you already got this covenant. We're friends. We're doing great together. Now we're sitting here making a plan to find out what my dad's going to do, whether he's going to kill you or not. And he says, but let's add to the covenant. Let's add to this covenant. Not just me, but all of my house. Because he's got kids. Jonathan's got kids. We're going to find out in 2 Samuel that there was a young man named Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth was Jonathan's child. And when we find out that Saul is killed and Jonathan's killed and, and the Philistines are winning because they wouldn't let David uh, come and fight for them who God has anointed to win the battles and to, and to give them victory. It's just like Jesus. Listen to me. Jesus has been anointed, he's the anointed Messiah, and he's given us victory. And if we don't walk in it, then we will reject his salvation, then we're going to surely die. Just as Saul did on Mount Geboa, right? And he took his own life, fell on a sword, but really God killed him because the next thing you know, an Amalekite walks up and puts him out of his misery because he didn't die by himself. But anyway, when we reject that, it's the same thing. But when they all die... Here comes David later, and you can read about it, I think, in uh, 2 Samuel 9. We'll be there. And David remembers this covenant, this promise that he made to Jonathan. And he says, is there any of the family of Jonathan alive that I can bless them and they can eat from my table forever? See, that's a picture of our salvation. We didn't deserve it. Mephibosheth doesn't deserve it. In fact, when a new king comes on, they would always kill all the other family. So that nobody would try a coup and take over. And listen, David brings him right into his house and feeds him at his table. He restores all the land of Saul to him. And that's exactly what you and I get. We get all the inheritance from Christ and we're brought into the king's table. We receive grace when we should have received death. And that's what David gives Mephibosheth. Well, he does more than that. What does he do when he becomes king? He sends for Jonathan's sister, Michael, right? He sends for her, who he has married. And this is what started all of this. Saul was trying to keep him close so he could kill him, send him out to fight the enemy so he could kill him. And he sends for her and brings her back. So he takes care of all the house of Saul, even when any other king would have killed every one of them. And he takes care of them. And so, sadly, though, she's there, and David brings the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem, and he's rejoicing and worshiping God, and he's dancing, uh, uh, and it displeased her. And 
she speaks rudely to the king. And the king never sleeps with her. And she is barren for all of her life and she never bears fruit. Listen to me. You don't want to be displeased with what God is doing in your life, even when it hurts. Because the fruit comes out of worshiping him and going in the way and trusting him and living for him no matter what's going on. He is taking you out of you and putting Christ in you. And sometimes it goes through pain. Sometimes it goes through trial. Sometimes it goes through testing. Sometimes it happens in all the fire. But you come and you bring fruit through that. But if you don't let it happen, then you will be barren and no fruit in your life. Yet you're still married. Michael was still married to King David until she died all of her life. But she never bore any fruit because David's actions displeased her. Can I ask you tonight, are you pleased with God? I know there's things that's happened in your life and are happening now. And you say, I don't like them. But are you pleased that God loves you and he gave his son for you and that he's going to bring you into a heavenly hope and he's given you an inheritance and, and, and nothing down here, no matter what it is, compares to the glory we receive when we're with him. See, there's no reason to not be content with God's work with his plans and his ways. His way is the only way. Even Jesus, listen, I'm not telling you not to question it. Don't say, God, what's going on? Even Jesus said, Father, if there's any other way, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. It's your way. Listen, and the way to godliness is the cross. The way that godliness is to surrender to the work of the Holy Spirit. Don't make up your own plans as the church is doing today and they create religion. Don't make up your own, I call it culturanity. It's everywhere I look when I talk to the people of God. They're turning to books and tradition and somebody else's idea of a program instead of turning to the throne room and turning to the spirit of God and the word of God and the ways of God and doing the work of God for the will of God. It's his glory. It's not ours. And we're doing everything in the churches today except just getting into the word, prayer, and fellowship and trust in almighty God even when times are bad. So he said, just make a covenant. And so David keeps his covenant. And we'll see that in 2 Samuel and in future books. We'll see David keeping that because they are really close friends. And listen, the Bible says, uh, uh, in order to have friends, you must first be friendly. So you need to draw near and be friendly with God in order for him to be your friend. And he's going to tell you everything when you draw near and you spend time with him. Now, Jonathan, again, I'm going to finish this chapter, people, and it's going to take a minute, so uh, hold with me. Now, Jonathan, again, caused David to vow because he loved him. For he loved him as he loved his own soul. There's that statement again. We've seen it a couple times. Then Jonathan said to David, tomorrow is the new moon, and you will be missed because your seat will be empty. And when you have stayed three days, go down quickly and come to the place where you hid on the day of the deed. That was the time before he was hiding. And remain by the stone of Ezel, which means uh, a, a secret place, I think. Then I will shoot three arrows on the side as though I shot at a target. So he says, nobody would suspect that. He's a warrior. He's a soldier. And there I will send a lad saying, go find the arrows. If I expressly say to the lad, look, the arrows are on uh, this side of you, get them and come. Then as the Lord lives, there is safety for you and no harm. So if the, if the, if dad, King Saul says, oh, okay, he's down in Jerusalem. All right. He can spend time with his own family. He's going to shoot these arrows to one side and say, get them and come. And, 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 and the lad doesn't know what's going on. Doesn't even know David's hiding out there, but this is the way they, they did this secret code. So David will know whether his life is in danger and whether he should flee or not. 22. But if I say thus to the young man, look, the arrows are beyond you. 
Go your way, for the Lord has sent you away. This is their fleece. And as for the matter which you and I have spoken of, indeed the Lord be between you and me forever. So 23 was yes to the covenant. 23 was I will commit completely to you forever, David. And this is their plan. 24, then David hid in the field. They're going to work out their plan. They're going to do it now. David hid in the field. And when the new moon had come, the king sat down to eat the feast. King Saul does. Now the king sat on his seat as at other times. On a seat by the wall. You know why he's by the wall? When you have enemies, you put your back to the wall. When you're concerned about your life, you put your back to the wall and you watch the room. He's sitting in the place where he's watching the room. When I was in prison, I did that a whole lot. You wanted to know what was going on all around you. And your back isn't covered. See, our back, you and I, we can sit anywhere now because our back is covered by God. We are, we are in the hands of God. We can trust God. And I purposely try to put my back in the middle of the room when I go into a restaurant. But in prison, I would put my back to the wall. I would try to find a place. And you couldn't always do that. They made you sit where, you know, where it's your turn. But you'd always want to be able to watch what was going on. When you had enemies or you knew that there could be a fight at any time and you didn't know who the enemy was or where he was. But you can trust God. Listen, you don't have to put your back to the wall. You don't have to have a heart that is hard and worried about it. You can trust God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And Jonathan arose, and Abner sat by Saul's side. I think the, the Vulgate says, uh, the Septuagint says, Jonathan sat across from uh, he said across, Jonathan said across from Saul. And Abner sat by Saul's side, but David's place was empty. Nevertheless, Saul did not say anything that day, for he thought something had happened to him. He was unclean. Surely he is unclean. So he's thinking, well, he's touched something. He's unclean. I mean, if you go back and read in Leviticus, almost anything can make you unclean. And in every one of the festivals, all the holy days, you had to be clean to participate in them. You know, when we again, we've talked about this so many times. When the Pharisees would paint all the tombs with whitewash, and Jesus called them whitewashed tombs, it was the reason they painted them white they would do it when they come close to Passover, so they would never touch them. They'd be able to see them clearly, because if they touched them, they would be unclean for seven days, and they wouldn't be able to celebrate the Passover. So they would paint them. They had somebody else paint them all white, so they could see them, and they knew they wouldn't be unclean. And they were painstakingly religious not to do anything to be unclean, so they could celebrate the Passover. That's why they handed Jesus over to Rome. They didn't want to be involved in a murder scheme, even though in their hearts they were killing the Messiah. They thought they were still okay. They were rejecting him. So anyway, he thought he was unclean. He thought, well, he'll be here tomorrow. Uh, he'll get cleaned up. But notice his heart. He's got murder in his heart. He's got jealousy in his heart. He's got fear in his heart. His back is against the wall. He's looking. He wants to kill David. He's playing religion. He's celebrating a religious festival, even when he knows he's plotting to kill. And it's us, you know, if we have hate in our heart, listen to me. We need to practice forgiveness. Why? Because it saves your life. If you have hate in your heart to somebody and you're, you won't forgive them, then you're murdering them and you're playing religion because you have to give up that hate to save your own life. That's the reason. Because it kills your heart. Hate will kill your heart. Bitterness eats you up inside. It will defile many. And it happened the next day, the second day of the month, that David's place was empty. And Saul said to Jonathan, his son, why has the son of Jesse not come to eat either yesterday or today? Do you notice how much hate he has? He won't even say David's name. He calls him the son of Jesse. And he asked Jonathan because he knows they're in cahoots together. So Jonathan answered Saul, David earnestly asked permission of me to go to Bethlehem. Do you see the line? They had a Deceptive, deceptive plan, and he just dishonored his dad in the plan by lying clearly to him. Listen, 
Every lie is from the father of lies. Every lie. You hear me? There's no good lies. It's better to keep your mouth shut than to lie. And he said, please let me go for our family has a sacrifice in the city and my brother has commanded me to be there. Now notice, notice his heart. He's making up details. This is not just following a plan. He's selling it. So there's some stuff going on in his heart to sell this to dad because he's upset with dad because dad's trying to kill an innocent man. Listen, listen, God is sovereign. He allows these things to go on. You don't have to lie to protect innocent people. What you have to do is keep serving God no matter what's going on. Tell the truth or be silent. So he tells the brother commanded him to be there. And now if I have found favor in your eyes, please let me get away and see my brothers. Therefore, he has not come to the king's table. So he tells him this elaborate lie. He's elaborating on it about why David is not there. And this is their fleece. Let's fleece him with a lie. Let's tell him that we're someplace else that we're not when we're really hiding out here in the field, really close to the throne room. Listen, are you hiding in a field close to the throne room, but not in the throne room? Are you hiding from the will of God in your life? Are you hiding from the ways of God, the sovereignty of God? Because, listen, everything that's going on, and you're making excuses not to do what God's calling you to do, God is calling you to do that. It's not the devil. You are God's child. He's the one that's protecting you, and we're listening to the lies of the devil and putting ourselves in a bad place instead of in our father's house. Then Saul's anger was aroused. Watch his heart. Remember Matthew 13, or excuse me, 12, 34 says, Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. He's holding this in a whole day. He's like, where is this son of Jesse? I will kill him. I'll pin him to the wall. I ain't worshiping right now. Because see, last time he went to kill him, he was worshiping. And the Spirit of God came upon him. Give him a little taste of what he had before he was rejected. But watch what he does. His anger was aroused. Listen, don't let your anger keep growing. Forgive. Practice forgiveness. Deal with your anger. Lay it down at the throne room. Let God deal with your heart. Accept God's ways. Listen, listen, do you understand who Saul is fighting against? He's not fighting David. He's fighting against God. God's the one that rejected him. He's fighting against God. God is the one that said your kingdom will not continue. He's fighting against God. Don't find yourself fighting against God. It's a terrible place to be. His anger was aroused against his own son. And he said to him, you son of a perverse, rebellious woman. Do I not know that you have chosen the son of Jesse, he wouldn't say David again, to your own shame and to the shame of your mother's nakedness? For as long as the son of Jesse lives on the earth, you shall not be established, nor your kingdom, nor therefore, now, now therefore send and bring him to me, for he shall surely die. See, he knows that Jonathan knows where he's at. He knows that he's lying to him. And he knows what's going on. And he's like, listen. And, he, and he blame, he's like, you, you, look at you. You're a, you're, a, you're a shame and a disgrace to your own mother's nakedness. It's as if you have uncovered her nakedness. This is so terrible. And he's trying to, to make him feel bad about his plan to keep David safe and protect him. And he's trying to guilt him into bringing David out and killing him. Listen. You can't kill Jesus. You can deny him. You can reject him. But the darkness cannot put out his light. You cannot overcome him. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And it is true that as long as Jesse, the son of Jesse, lives, Jonathan will never be king. Listen to me. As long as as you reject Jesus, he can never be king in your life. As long as you're king on the throne of your life, Jesus can never be king in your life. 
It's very important that there can only be one king in your life. There can only be one person first, and it's either you or it's Jesus. If you're first with your plans and your strength and your lives and your kingdom, then you've rejected Jesus. God will not take second place in your heart. He only takes first place. Second place is no place at all. See, the covenant that David and Jonathan made was, is that Jonathan said, I'll be second, and you be first, David, because I know God has anointed you king, and I want to choose the same king. And that's the agreement that you and I need to make. That's the covenant we've entered into. Isn't that right? Marriage covenant. Yes. We're the bride. You're the head, Jesus. I'll be second. I'll listen. I'll follow. I'll be in the way with and I know that you love me because you laid your life down for me. That's the way marriage is supposed to be too. Because the husband lays his life down for his wife as Christ did for the church. Look at this. Jonathan intercedes again, verse 32. And Jonathan answered Saul, his father, and said to him, Why should he be killed? What has he done? There's no sin in him. Herod said, I wash my hands of this. Pilate. He's an innocent man. Jonathan said, he's innocent, Dad. Look what happens in 33. Then Saul cast a spear at him to kill him, by which Jonathan knew it was determined by his father to kill David. Now, here's there's two ways to look at this, and I don't know Hebrew, so I don't know the tenses. You can see Saul's heart, though. Did he just throw a spear at his own son again to try to kill him? Remember he tried to kill him with an oath he made before when they were fighting? And Jonathan ate some honey. And he said, even if it's Jonathan, we'll kill him. Now, he either just threw a spear at Jonathan and Jonathan stepped away from it. Or he just threw a spear at David's empty chair like he was throwing it at David. I don't know. There's two possibilities there. It reads like he threw it at his own son. And that's how anger and hate in your heart and unforgiveness spreads. It begins to try to kill everybody around you that doesn't agree with you. Listen to me. You want to get away from truth. You want to run from it. When you have unforgiveness in your heart, hate in your heart, anger in your heart, you don't want to be around truth. You don't want to do anything but kill everybody who is giving you truth. And you want to cut their heads off like they are John the Baptist. Remember Herod cut his head off? He didn't want to hear it anymore. And that's what this happens when you reject Jesus. You reject his ambassadors and you reject all truth. Listen to me. Sadly, the church today has been deceived by the devil into rejecting truth. We're making up our own ways, our own plans, our own religion and we don't have King Jesus sitting in the throne room on his seat. It's important to understand that. He's not there. And we need to put him there. He's the one we should be listening to. So Jonathan arose from the table in fierce anger. Now Jonathan, see the anger is spreading. Now Jonathan's made friends with an angry man. It's his dad. And he's become angry. And ate no food the second day of the month, for he was grieved for David because his father had treated him shamefully. Um, so he fasted. Listen, he fasted. That's not a bad thing. When's the last time you fasted food? When's the last time you went to fast food? No, when you fasted food. <laughs> When's the last time we wanted to know the heart of God and to be right with God that we would give up our earthly appetites so we could hear the voice of God and do the right thing for God? That's what fasting is about. You're not trying to manipulate God. You're saying, God, my earthly appetite is, is not important. Your word is important. Your voice is important. Your answer is important. And I'm not going to eat today. I'm going to skip that so I can pray and talk to you and I can hear from you. See, when we keep feeding self, we keep feeding our bodily appetite. When we keep feeding our flesh, it silences the voice of God and the word of God and the ways of God. Because Jonathan was grieved, he fasted. 
he didn't eat. And so it was in the morning, Jonathan went out. So on the third day, he went to the field at the time appointed with David, and a little lad was with him. Then he said to the lad, now run, find the arrows which I shoot. And he's finishing this plan. As the lad ran, he shot an arrow beyond him. When the lad came to the place where the arrow was, which Jonathan had shot, Jonathan cried out to the lad and said, Is not the arrow beyond you? And Jonathan cried out after the lad, Make haste, hurry, do not delay. So he's telling David to get, to flee. So Jonathan, Jonathan's lad gathered up the arrows and came back to his master. But the lad did not know anything. Only Jonathan and David knew of the matter. Then Jonathan gave his weapons to the lad and said to him, Go, carry them to the city. So it's probably his armor bearer. Take these back into the city. As soon as the lab was gone, David arose from the place toward the south, fell on his face to the ground, and bowed down three times. And they kissed one another, and they wept together, but David more so. Listen, remember Jesus wept. He wanted to, Jesus wept because he wanted to gather uh, uh, Israel like a mother gathers her hands, and he wept because they were not willing. Listen, David wanted to be right with Saul. David wanted to be in that seat. David wanted to forgive and to do the right thing. But he weeps because he has to flee to keep from being killed. He's rejected. He's rejected by the rejected king. The chosen king is rejected by Saul. Listen, this is normal. They loved each other. They're in a covenant. It's normal in the, in the East to kiss one another and, and, and to weep together. Real men cry. Then Jonathan said to David, Go in peace, since we have both sworn in, in the name of the Lord, saying, May the Lord be between you and me and between your descendants and my descendants. That was their covenant and their bond forever. So he arose and departed, and Jonathan went into the city. Listen, David is going to run and run and run. He's going to play mad. He's going to go through a lot of things. He's even going to live with the enemy, the Philistines, for a while and with their kings because he's not trusting the Lord's plan. Are you trusting the Lord's plan or are you living according to your own devices? Have you asked God to search you and know you, try you and know your anxious thoughts and see if there's any wicked way in you? And lead you in the way everlasting? Are you letting the Spirit of God lead you? Are you meeting in the throne room? Are you living today with God on the throne? Are you in the way with Jesus? Listen to me. It's so important because the devil deceives us into getting a little bit off of course, a little bit out of the Word, a little bit over here, and I can do a little bit of this, and pretty soon we're trying to kill. Jesus ourself because we don't want to hear truth. We don't want to hear it because then we have to come to our senses and return to him. And our hearts grow hard. Our hearts grow hard. Notice that David honored him. Even though he had laid down his garments, David bowed to the ground to him three times and honored him who was the prince at that time, who was supposed to be the future king of a physical kingdom and he honored the covenant they had where Jonathan gave him truth and told him that his life was in danger listen to me if you're not living for Jesus and in the way with him and not in the word prayer and fellowship and asking the Holy Spirit to change your heart and teach you to live rightly for God your life is in danger and the devil is deceiving you if you're not forgiving people around you your life is in danger and the devil is deceiving you. If you're not letting the Spirit lead you and you're not worshiping in spirit and truth and trusting the Word of God, your life is in danger. It's in danger. And the devil is deceiving you. I actually wish the story that Jonathan would have followed David and he doesn't. Jonathan dies on Mount Geboa with his dad because he continued to honor his dad and follow him. Again, just as I think Michael should have went out the window with David, I think Jonathan should have left with David here and followed him. 
because you want to choose the king that God has chosen. You want to choose the provision that God has given. And no matter how it ends up, always cling to God by faith and trust in him to the end because he loves you with a never-ending love. Amen? Amen. Father, thank you for this example of a testimony of your word, of what to do and what not to do, how to live and how not to live. Lord, we want to choose King Jesus, the king that you have chosen. We want to be led by your spirit, and we want to worship you. We want to worship you according to your word. Thank you. Lord, help us to make that covenant with you and help us to have friends that we can question, we can talk to, and that will speak into our life in a way that will keep us right with you. We give you praise and glory, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.